Lecture 11, The Sensory Modalities. In this lecture, we'll discuss how sensory experience, seeing, hearing, tasting, smelling, and so on, is organized. We now understand that learning does not represent merely a relatively permanent change in behavior resulting from experience, as traditional definitions would have it. Rather, learning represents a change in knowledge. Through various learning processes, the organism acquires new knowledge about itself in the world that allows it to predict and control events. The implication of this cognitive view of learning is that human beings and other organisms like us, primates certainly, other mammals as well, are cognitive beings. Our behavior goes beyond innate, pre-programmed reflexes, taxis, and instincts, and includes actions that are based on our understanding of ourselves and the world. This intelligent behavior requires that we acquire information about ourselves and the world around us. We integrate this new information with prior knowledge. We store this new knowledge in memory, so it will be available for use later. We use this knowledge to plan and execute actions that will help us to cope with environmental demands and achieve our personal goals. And we use language as a tool, not just for communicating with others, but also as a tool for thinking, reasoning, and problem solving. So how do we know the world? This is a question that modern philosophers have been debating since at least the 16th century. According to a philosophical view known as nativism, associated with René Descartes, a 16th century French philosopher, non-human animals acquire knowledge through their sensory experiences. According to Descartes, who was a devout Roman Catholic, the human mind contains some knowledge that exists independent of sensory experience, because it comes from God. On the other side of the debate was the empiricism espoused by John Locke, a 17th century English philosopher. Against Descartes, Locke argued that all knowledge comes to us by way of sensory experiences, either through sensation, by which we observe external objects, or through reflection, by which we observe the workings of our own minds. It was Locke's empiricism, by the way, that provided the philosophical background for the concept of conditioning and the early learning theories of Pavlov and Thorndike, Watson and Skinner. Immanuel Kant, an 18th century German philosopher, provided a useful synthesis of nativism and empiricism. Like Locke, Kant believed that knowledge was acquired through experience, but he also believed that our experience of the world presumes the prior existence of certain innate mental structures, ideas such as space, time, and other categories of thought. For example, Locke adhered to the tra traditional principle of association by contiguity, meaning that events were associated with each other if they occurred close together in space and time. That was a kind of experience that he thought formed the basis for all knowledge. But if you think about it for a second, you see that you can't experience contiguity unless you already have some idea of space and time. Never mind, in the present context, that the principle of association by contiguity is wrong. The point is that you can't acquire associations between events that are contiguous in space and time unless you already know what space and time are. Similarly, in terms of our modern understanding of association based on contingency, you can't form associations based on contingency unless you already have the concepts of correlation and causation. Either way, Kant seems to have it right. Sensory experience presupposes some kind of mental structure that serves as a filter or an organizing principle for sensory experience. Despite the power of Kant's synthesis, the tension between nativism and empiricism runs throughout the study of cognition and, for that matter, throughout all of psychology. We'll see it again and again in this course. But nobody, not even Descartes, denied the importance of sensory experience. 
Therefore, we begin our study of cognition where psychology itself began, with the study of sensation and perception. Sensation is the process by which we detect the presence of an object or event in the environment. The function of our sensory apparatus is to answer such questions as, is there something out there? Has it changed? And how strong is it? How intense is it? Perception forms a mental representation of that object or event. The function of our perceptual apparatus is to answer such questions as, what is it that's out there? Where is it exactly? And what is it doing? In sensation, we first have to distinguish between two kinds of stimulus, the distal stimulus and the proximal stimulus. The distal stimulus is the object of perception itself, the tree or the rock or the ocean or the car or whatever it is that we're sensing that exists in the world outside the mind. And the proximal stimulus consists of all the physical energies, the light waves, the sound waves, the chemicals, whatever, that emanate from the distal stimulus and fall on the sensory receptor organs associated with our eyes, our ears, nose, tongue, whatever. The proximal stimulus might be a pattern of light waves reflected from a tree, or a pattern of sound waves generated by the motion of the tree's branches and leaves as it sways in the wind or some other kind of physical energy radiated by or reflected from that object. The first step in sensation is transduction, where the conversion of the proximal stimulus, light waves, sound waves, whatever, into a neural impulse. This process of transduction is accomplished by a particular sensory receptor organ. There are many different receptor organs in the body, roughly corresponding to the different modalities of sensation, vision, audition, and the like. This neural impulse is then transmitted to the cerebral cortex of the brain, such as the primary visual area of the occipital lobe, via various neural pathways, such as the optic nerve. Sensation continues with the observer's detection of the stimulus and analysis of certain fundamental qualities, such as its intensity. And somewhere around this point, we begin to talk about perception. Not sensation, but perception, which ends with a mental representation, a mental image, if you will, of the distal stimulus, including a description of its physical features, an analysis of its meaning, and some sense of what its implications are. The question then is, how do we get from the distal stimulus, the tree, and the proximal stimulus, the pattern of light waves and sound waves and chemicals that come from the tree, to the perception of a tree in a particular place doing a particular kind of thing, like waving in the breeze or smelling like mesquite after a rainstorm? So the first step in the process of perceiving Forming a mental representation of the world is sensation, transforming the physical energies, the proximal stimuli which radiate from the distal stimulus in the world into neural impulses that will travel through the nervous system. So the next question then is, how many senses are there? How many different kinds of sensory experiences? The Greek philosopher Aristotle gave the traditional answer that there are five special senses. Vision, the sense of seeing. Audition, the sense of hearing. Olfaction, the sense of smelling. Gustation, the sense of tasting. And then touch, the tactile sense, the sense of feeling. However, modern psychology tends to identify nine different sensory modalities or general domains in which sensation occurs. These modalities may be arranged hierarchically, beginning with the division, initially proposed by Charles Sherrington in 1906, into two broad categories, extraoception and proprioception. 
Extraoception refers to sensations that arise from stimulation of sensory receptors on or near the surface of the body, from external stimuli, and includes three subcategories. In the distant senses, there is no direct contact between the distal stimulus and the sense organ. Rather, radiated energy travels some distance between the stimulus and the receptor. The distant senses include vision and audition. In the chemical senses, the proximal stimulus is a chemical molecule. The chemical senses include gustation, the sense of taste, and olfaction, the sense of smell. And in the skin senses, the distal stimulus makes contact more or less with the surface of the skin and stimulates receptors that are buried underneath. Whereas Aristotle identified only one skin sense, the sense of touch, modern psychology identifies at least three different skin senses, or cutaneous senses. The sense of touch, the tactile sense, the sense of temperature, or the thermal sense, and the sense of pain, which is sometimes called nociception. Proprioception refers to sensations that, occur, that concern the position and the motion of the body, and here there appear to be two different kinds of proprioception. In kinesthesis, the sensation is of the motion of the body and the, and the position of various body parts. In equilibrium, also known as the vestibular sense, there's a sense of up and down, or a sense of balance. You can also think of the skin senses as belonging to the category of proprioception, too, because we can also have tactile sensations and sensations of warmth and cold and pain on the internal parts of our bodies, in our stomach, our throat, and so on. But we're not going to consider that here. Finally, Sherrington also identified a category of interoception, which receives stimulation from internal tissues and organs like the viscera and the blood vessels. These sensory mechanisms are important in the regulation of bodily processes like hunger and thirst. But because they don't typically give rise to con conscious sensations, we won't consider this category of sensation further in these lectures. We're going to focus just on extraoception, and proprioception. But how do we really know how many sensory modalities there are? How do we know that Aristotle was wrong and Sherrington was right, or at least close to right? Well, to begin with, the organization of the sensory modalities illustrates the basic concept of transduction, the conversion of some physical stimulus energy into a neural impulse, and that transduction is accomplished by the sensory receptors. Looking over the various sensory modalities, at first glance it appears as if each sensory receptor is specifically responsive to a different class of proximal stimulus energy, which in turn radiates from a distal stimulus. In transduction, a particular type of physical energy is converted into a neural impulse which is carried by a sensory tract, an afferent nerve, to a particular part of the brain known as a sensory projection area. So we could say that these four features differentiate among the various modalities of sensation, that each modality of sensation is associated with a specific proximal stimulus, a specific receptor organ that converts that stimulus into a neural impulse, a specific sensory tract which carries that neural impulse toward the central nervous system, and a projection area in the brain where that neural impulse, arising from the receptor organ, eventually ends up. Let's see how this works in simplified form for each of the nine sensory modalities that we've just identified. In vision, the proximal stimulus consists of light waves. These are electromagnetic waves electromagnetic radiation emitted by or reflected from some distal stimulus. Now, not all light waves give rise to the experience of seeing, at least in humans. Humans are sensitive only to wavelengths of about 380 to 780 nanometers, 
That's billionths of a meter. That's the visible spectrum for us. Other wavelengths, such as infrared waves that are longer than 780 nanometers, or ultraviolet waves that are shorter than 380 nanometers, are not visible to the human eye, though they might be visible to other animals. So again, the proximal stimulus is light waves of a particular length. These light waves pass through the cornea of the eye and then through the pupil, and they are focused by the lens of the eye so that they fall on the retina on the inside rear of the eyeball. These light waves falling on the retina of the eye comprise what is known as the retinal image. There, the light waves impinge on two types of receptor organs, rods and cones. There are about 100 million rods, and there are about 7 million cones in the retina of the human eye, so they're very small and they're very tightly packed. These rods and cones take the light waves, the retinal image, and transduce it into a pattern of neural impulses. And this transduction is accomplished by a chemical process. Once the transduction has taken place, the neural impulse travels via a number of cells to the optic nerve, which is the cranial nerve number two, the second cranial nerve, and then eventually to the lateral geniculate nucleus, which is a bundle of neurons, which is part of the thalamus. The visual impulses finally arrive at the primary visual cortex, which we've already discussed, in the occipital lobe, which is known as area V1. This primary visual cortex corresponds to Broadman's area 17. Because there's been so much research on visual sensation and perception, let's look at how vision operates in a little bit more detail. First, in the left-hand diagram, let's look a little bit more closely at the visual system of the eye. Remember that in vision, the proximal stimulus consists of light waves, electromagnetic radiation of a particular wavelength that constitutes the visible spectrum of light for the human eye. These light waves pass through the cornea of the eye and then through the pupil, the size of which is controlled by the iris. Under conditions of dim light, the pupil widens to let more light in. Under conditions of bright light, the pupil contracts. This light is then focused by the lens of the eye so that it falls on the retina on the inside back of the eyeball. And technically, this retinal image is the proximal stimulus for vision. It's literally an image of the object the person is looking at. The retina has embedded in it these two types of receptor organs, rods and cones. The rods are stimulated by different levels of brightness, or, if you will, the intensity of the light. They're responsible for black and white vision, and they're especially important for seeing at night. The cones are stimulated by different wavelengths of light, and as we'll see in the next lecture, they're responsible for color vision and are particularly useful during the day. So the retina of the eye consists of these rods and cones, which are the sensory receptors for the proximal stimulus. There are a lot more rods than there are cones. Some animals, like cats, don't have very many cones at all, if cats have any. Cats really don't have color vision, but they have lots of rods, so they're very good at seeing objects at night. Turning to the right-hand figure, once transduction has taken place by the rods and the cones, the neural impulse that's generated travels via cells known as bipolar cells to other cells known as ganglion cells, and then is carried over the optic nerve, the second cranial nerve. Different fibers of the optic nerve meet and cross as what, at what's known as the optic chiasm, a division in the optic nerves which projects each half field to the opposite hemisphere of the brain. So retinal images from the left visual field of each eye end up in the right hemisphere, and retinal images from the right visual field of each eye project to the left hemisphere. Farther along, 
these visual impulses pass through another structure, the lateral geniculate nucleus, which, as I noted, is a bundle of neurons that is part of the thalamus. In fact, most afferent impulses, including vision, hearing, taste, and the skin senses, all pass through one portion of the thalamus or another on their way to their respective sensory projection areas. The thalamus acts as a kind of sensory relay station that directs impulses arising from various sensory receptors to their appropriate cortical projection areas. And then finally, the visual impulses arrive where they're supposed to, at the visual cortex, area V1, Broadman's area 17, in the occipital lobe. Now let's take a look at audition, the sense of hearing. In audition, the proximal stimulus consists of sound waves, mechanical vibrations in the air set up by the vibration of the distal stimulus. And again, for humans, audible sound waves have a particular range of frequencies. They range from about 20 to about 20,000 cycles per second. Other species have different ranges of audible frequencies. For example, bats which use ultrasonic frequencies, frequencies that are higher than 20,000 cycles per second, as a kind of sonar to navigate. In any event, these sound waves are funneled by the outer ear into the auditory canal, and then set the tympanic membrane into sympathetic vibration. These vibrations then pass through bony structures known as the ossicles. There are three of these, the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup, or the malleus, the incus, and the stapes, then to the oval window, and then to the basilar membrane in the cochlea of the inner ear. The basilar membrane also vibrates sympathetically, just as the tympanic membrane did, and in the course of this vibration, it vibrates against hair cells. These hair cells are the actual sensory receptors. Mechanical stimulation of the hair cells and the cochlea thus sets up neural impulses which are transmitted over the cochlear branch of the vestibulocochlear nerve, which is also known as cranial nerve 8. These neural impulses then eventually pass through another portion of the thalamus known as the medial geniculate nucleus and then finally to the auditory projection area in the temporal lobe of the brain, A1, Broadman's area 41. Again, because there's so much known about auditory sensation and perception, let's look in a little bit closer detail how the auditory system works. We won't do this for all nine sensory modalities, just for vision and audition, so that you can get an idea of how complex these systems can be. Again, looking first at the left-hand diagram, you see the outer and the inner ear. Audible sound waves are funneled by the auricle of the outer ear into the auditory canal, and then set the tympanic membrane into sympathetic vibration. All that happens in the outer ear. Then, in the middle ear, the vibrations are passed through these bony structures, sometimes known as the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup, or technically known as the malleus, that's Latin for hammer, the incus, that's Latin for anvil, and the stapes, that's Latin for stirrup, to the oval window. These sympathetic vibrations then pass via the oval window into the inner ear, where the basilar membrane in the cochlea vibrates against hair cells. And again, these hair cells are ultimately the receptor organs for the sense of hearing. Turning to the right-hand diagram, we can see where these neural impulses travel in the brain. The auditory impulses generated by the hair cells are carried over the cochlear branch of the vestibulocochlear nerve, cranial nerve 8. They then pass through the cochlear nucleus embedded in the medulla to the other side of the brain. Remember, 
the left ear projects to the right hemisphere, the right ear projects to the left hemisphere. Just as the left visual field of each eye projects to the right hemisphere, and the right visual field projects to the left. These neural impulses are then carried to another structure, known as the inferior colliculus, up to another portion of the thalamus known as the medial geniculate nucleus, and then finally to A1, or Brodmann's area 41, the auditory projection area in the temporal lobe of the brain. Gustation the sense of taste begins with certain chemical molecules that are carried on food and drink, and, for that matter, anything else you put in your mouth, and they're dissolved in saliva. Remember Pavlov's work on the salivary reflex that got him the Nobel Prize and began the study of classical conditioning. That's why he was interested in the salivary reflex. These chemical molecules, dissolved in the saliva, then fall on taste buds that are located in the papillae, or the bumps of the tongue. There may also be similar kinds of taste buds in the palate and in the back of the mouth. But in any event, neural impulses generated by these taste buds are carried over the sensory portion of the glossopharyngeal nerve, that's cranial nerve 9, as well as other cranial nerves, such as the facial nerve, cranial nerve 7, and maybe even the vagus nerve, cranial nerve 10, before they arrive at what is known as the primary gustatory cortex. This primary gustatory cortex is located in two parts of the frontal lobe, known as the anterior insula and the frontal operculum. The insula, indicated here with a blue arrow, is a portion of the frontal lobe that is tucked inside the lateral fissure. You really can't see it if you look at the brain from the outside. And the operculum is a portion of the frontal lobe that folds down over the lateral fissure and is adjacent to the temporal lobe. Operculum comes from the Latin, meaning the lid, and it's like a lid that falls down and hides the insula from view. The interior insula and the frontal operculum constitute the primary gustatory cortex. But it's also possible that some taste sensations also go to somatosensory cortex in the parietal lobe, especially that part of the cortex that's near the part of the somatosensory cortex that monitors the tongue. Olfaction, the sense of smell, works on much the same principle. It begins with other chemical molecules, this time carried on air, which enter the nose and dissolve in the mucous membrane of the nasal cavity. Neural impulses are generated when these molecules make contact with receptor cells that are embedded in the olfactory epithelium. The resulting neural impulses are then transmitted to the olfactory bulb, which is embedded in the frontal lobe of the brain the lower portion of the frontal lobe, and from there to the olfactory nerve, which is also cranial nerve 1, and then they're carried to the primary olfactory cortex, which is in the limbic system of the brain, in structures known as the prepiriform cortex, piriform just means pear-shaped, and the periamygdaloid complex, a set of structures that surround the amygdala in the limbic lobe. The olfactory sense is a very primitive sense, and it's one of the few sensory modalities that does not pass through some portion of the thalamus on its way to its primary projection area. The proximal stimulus for the tactile sense, the sense of touch, is mechanical pressure, which causes deformation of the skin or of the hair shafts that are embedded in the skin. The tactile sense is also sensitive to vibrations, not just pressure, and also to electrical stimulation. But mostly, when we talk about the proximal stimulus for touch, we're talking about mechanical pressure. And depending on whether this mechanical pressure actually deforms the skin or bends the hair shafts, various kinds of mechanoreceptors embedded in the skin get stimulated. Some of these are known as free nerve endings because that's just what they look like. 
They just look like nerve endings that are buried in the epidermis of the skin. Others are known as perifollicular, or basket endings. Perifollicular means they surround the hair follicle. Basket endings are wrapped around the base of hair follicles. There are also other sensory structures known as Merkel's discs, Meissner's corpuscles, and the Pecinian corpuscles. And for all that we know, there may be others. Neural impulses arising from these receptor organs are then carried over the afferent tracts of the spinal nerves and up the afferent tract of the spinal cord, as well as over some of the cranial nerves that have an afferent component to them. For example, the trigeminal nerve, cranial nerve 5, and the facial nerve, cranial nerve 6. So there are both spinal nerves and cranial nerves that carry tactile impulses from the skin. These impulses ultimately arrive at the somatosensory projection area of the parietal lobe. That's the somatosensory cortex and are distributed to the appropriate region of the somatosensory cortex according to the somatosensory homunculus. We can tell much the same story for the thermal sense, the sense of temperature, except that the proximal stimulus and the receptor organs are a little bit different. The stimulus for temperature, the sense of warmth or cold, is not, as you might expect, warm or cold objects on or near the skin. Instead, the proximal stimulus for the sense of temperature is a differential in temperature between the stimulus and the skin itself. So cold and warm, in some absolute sense, are not the effective proximal stimuli. A stimulus is felt to be cold only if its temperature is lower than that of the skin with which it makes contact. And the same thing goes for warmth. A stimulus is felt to be warm only if its temperature is higher than that of the skin with, with which it makes contact. These positive and negative temperature differentials then stimulate neural activity in two specific thermoreceptors, known as the Krause end bulbs, which are sensitive to relatively cold stimuli, and the Ruffini end organs, which are sensitive to relatively warm stimuli. Now, that's cold and warm. What about hot? It turns out that simultaneous stimulation of both receptors is what generates the sensation of hot. Both the warm and the cold receptors stimulated together generate the sensation of hot. The free nerve endings are also sensitive to temperature differentials, and they may be especially sensitive to hot, since hot objects are especially painful. But mostly when it comes to, th to the thermal sense, the receptor organs are the Krause end bulbs and the Ruffini end organs. However they are generated, the neural impulses travel over the afferent tracts of the spinal nerves and the afferent tract of the spinal cord to the brain as well as over some of the cranial nerves, just as with the sense of touch. And these impulses, too, finally end up at this primary somatosensory area of the parietal cortex. The situation is complicated with respect to pain. Usually, we think of pain as a skin sense, but it's really more complicated than this. Almost any stimulus will produce pain if it's intense enough. Very intense sounds are painful. Very intense lights are painful. Intense heat and cold are painful. Pain can also be produced by muscle fatigue. And if you put salt into a wound or some other opening in the skin, that's going to be painful. So there's no unique proximal stimulus for pain. However, right now we're going to focus our attention on cutaneous pain, pain that arises from the area of the skin. And for cutaneous pain, there's a very clear proximal stimulus, which is inflammation that arises from injury to or the destruction of cutaneous tissue, skin tissue. If you injure yourself, your skin becomes inflamed and it's that inflammation that stimulates the free nerve endings in the epidermis of the skin.
These are sensitive to touch and movement, and they may be sensitive to temperature as well, but they're especially sensitive to inflammation, pain stimulation. In fact, there appear to be two different kinds of fibers that are especially important here. These are known as A-delta fibers and C fibers. A-delta fibers are important in mediating what's known as fast pain, sharp pricking pain with a rapid onset and a rapid offset. Fast pain appears to be mediated by A-delta fibers. And what we call slow pain, aching, throbbing, burning pain that comes on slowly and goes away slowly, that appears to be mediated by so-called C-fibers. Fast and slow pain are mediated by different fibers in the peripheral nervous system. And it turns out that fast and slow pain messages travel to the brain along different tracks of the spinal cord. Fast pain sensations travel along the neo-spinothalamic tract, and slow pain sensations travel along the paleo-spinothalamic tract. As the names of these tracts imply, the pain messages pass through the thalamus and then into the somatosensory cortex. You've probably noticed that while the three skin senses have different proximal stimuli and different receptor organs, they have the same sensory tracts and pretty much the same sensory projection area in the cerebral cortex. To make a long story short, all the different cutaneous sensations travel over the same afferent tract of the spinal nerves, up the same afferent tract in the spinal cord, and end up in the same somatosensory cortex of the parietal lobe. So there's a puzzle here about how the skin senses are kept separate, and we don't really know how that works, yet. Whether it's the sense of touch, or the sense of temperature, or the sense of cutaneous pain, all those sensations arrive at the same portion of the parietal lobe, the somatosensory cortex, where they're distributed to various parts according to the somatosensory homunculus. Sensory impulses from the feet and the lower leg and the genitalia end up in areas adjacent to the longitudinal fissure that divides the brain into two hemispheres. Sensations from the upper legs and the trunk area of the body to the lateral portion, up around the top of the brain along the central fissure. Then the arms, the hand, the fingers, the face, and then the jaw, the tongue, the pharynx, and the viscera. We know that that's where these sensory impulses end up because in stroke patients, lesions to various parts of this somatosensory cortex knock out all the cutaneous senses, not just the sense of touch. But again, exactly how the brain keeps them straight, keeps them separate, is something we don't know yet. The situation with the skin senses is compounded even further by proprioception and, in particular, kinesthesis, the sense of movement and position in various parts of the body. Here again, we have specific proximal stimuli and specific receptor organs, but the afferent tracts, the sensory tracts, and the cortical projection areas appear to be the same as for the skin senses. The proximal stimulus for kinesthesis, the sense of movement and position, is activity in the skeletal musculature, the contraction of tendons, the stretching of muscles, and of the skin that surrounds the muscles, and the movement of the joints. These activities stimulate nerve endings that are embedded in these various body parts, and there are particular neurons involved. Embedded in the muscles, are neuromuscular spindles. There are also neurotendinous organs, known as Golgi organs, embedded in the tendons. And then there are free nerve endings in the joints between the bones. So when muscles stretch and tendons contract and joints move, these receptor organs pick up this information, and then these neural impulses are carried over the afferent tract of the spinal nerves, up the afferent tract of the spinal cord, and to the somatosensory projection area of the parietal lobe.
That brings us finally to the vestibular sense, the sense of balance and equilibrium. This aspect of proprioception begins with gravitational force, which pulls on tiny crystals known as otoliths that are suspended in certain structures of the inner ear. The semicircular canals and the saccule and utricle of the vestibular sac. Both these canals and the vestibular sac are located in the inner ear. The semicircular canals are arranged at approximate right angles to each other, so that as gravity acts on the otoliths, it pulls them in various directions. The semicircular canals and vestibular sac contain hair cells, much like those that are in the cochlea which are stimulated by these crystals, which in turn move in response to the force of gravity. And these hair cells generate neural impulses in much the same manner as the hair cells of the cochlea do for audition. Rotary motion of the head, turning the head from left to right, will cause the otoliths to fall on different hair cells in the semicircular canals and thus they signal a change in the organism's orientation with respect to gravity. In much the same way, linear motion of the head in a forward direction causes the otoliths to, call, to fall on hair cells in the posterior portion of the vestibular sac, while motion in a backward direction stimulates hair cells in the anterior portion. In this way, the hair cells generate neural impulses that provide information about whether the head is moving forward or backward, to the left or right, or, for that matter, whether it's right side up or upside down. These neural impulses are then carried over the vestibular branch of the vestibulocochlear nerve, that's cranial nerve 8, and we saw the cochlear branch of this same nerve involved in audition. Where do these neural impulses go? Unlike kinesthesis and the skin senses, which travel to the somatosensory cortex, neural impulses relating to equilibrium and changes in motion are carried over the vestibular portion of the eighth cranial nerve to the cerebellum. Olfaction doesn't project through the thalamus on its way to its cortical projection area, and equilibrium doesn't project to the cerebral cortex at all it projects to the cerebellum instead. So there you have it. If the question is how we know our world and our place in it, the answer appears to be that we have at least nine different ways of knowing the world. We know the outside world through the distant senses of vision and audition, the chemical senses of gustation and olfaction, and the skin senses of touch temperature, and pain. And we know the relationship between ourselves and the world outside through the modalities of proprioception, through kinesthesis and equilibrium.